Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dwyer and this is part two of Ireland's last aristocrat, the life of Olive Pakenham Mahan. In the last episode, part one, we covered the early years of Olive's life up to her marriage in 1914. This was a story of big houses, servants, pomp, ceremony and privilege. This episode continues the story, but into a very different world. We'll be focusing on World War I and the Irish Revolution. This was an extremely dangerous time for aristocracies across the world, including Ireland. Indeed, by the end of this episode, we'll have reached the 1920s and Olive's world will be in free fall. Now, in the midst of this revolutionary change, we'll also see Olive engage in a love affair that scandalised her parents the details of which are preserved in letters, which you'll hear from in this episode as well. If you want to hear more about Olive and the story covered in this series, there's bonus episodes available for show supporters on Patreon and Acast+. Plus. These include exclusive interviews with historian Oshino Driscoll and archivist Martin Fagan from Strokestown Park House, who also feature in this episode as well. Now, you can get this today by becoming a supporter at Acast+, Plus or patreon.com forward slash irish podcast by becoming a supporter you also get access to ad free episodes and my exclusive upcoming series on the irish civil war with dr brian hanley from the history department of trinity college dublin you can find out more at patreon.com forward slash irish podcast that's patreon.com forward slash irish podcast i've links in the show notes below Finally, before we begin, the additional narrations are from Therese Murray and Aidan Crow. The artwork on the episode and the series in general is from Keith Hines and the sound was by Kate Dunley. Now to continue Olive's story. Last week we covered the early years of her life up to her marriage in 1914. This was a world of big houses, servants, pomp, ceremony and privilege. In this episode, everything changes. As we continue the story into World War I and the Irish Revolution, we will eventually reach the 1920s, when Olive's world will be in free fall. Everything she had once taken for granted was fast disappearing. On September 21st, 1914, Olive Pakenham Mahan made her way to Liverpool Street Station in central London. She had been married just over six weeks earlier and had already fallen pregnant, but she had come to this train station to bid farewell to her husband Edward, who was going off to war. Olive recalled the scene 67 years later in her final interview in 1981. I went off to see him off at Liverpool Street Station. I can see him now, putting his hand out of the window and sort of half-opening the door to come back to me and then pulling himself together and shutting himself in. After this emotional farewell, Olive returned to Ireland, but not to her childhood home, but instead she went to Rockingham, the large mansion her husband's family, the Stafford King Harmons, owned. In those early days of the war, Olive and indeed her entire generation had no idea what this conflict was going to be like. It had been decades since the British Empire had fought a major war. Most of their conflicts had been limited to colonial wars in distant lands where their opponents usually had inferior weaponry. Indeed, her generation saw war as an opportunity to emulate their ancestors who had won glory on the battlefield. When I visited Strokestown Park House, Oshino Driscoll, a historian and guide there, brought me around the house and it was obvious that Olive's childhood like most aristocrats, had been once steeped in militarism. The walls are adorned with past generations of her family, many of whom were wearing military uniforms. Even the toys that she would have played with as a child encouraged a belief that war was glorious, even fun. Oshin brought me to a room that's packed with toys that several generations of the family played with, and he pointed out one in particular. We have this, uh, yeah, it's a Crimean War era style British military uniform. It's, yeah, I mean, this is again, training children, military, 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 this is your job. We actually have an incredible insight, though, into how Olive viewed the war from its earliest days. Because when she returned to her new house, Rockingham, she began a war diary of a kind in which she confided her innermost thoughts. 
Remarkably, this would find its way back to Strokestown, where it remained unopened for decades. Martin Fagan, the archivist in Strokestown Park House, was the first person to read the diary, and he explains what it is. Uh, it was a locked diary again. It actually had, had never been opened. And uh, when I opened it up, I realised it was from Olive Packenham, and this is her War One diary. She writes this very, very personal. I, I, the first line of it is... Um, so, September, 20, uh, September 25th, 1914, Her will write him a sort of diary. For him to read when he gets home, because I cannot write him often. Now, the diary is written in a strange style, where Olive's references to Edward and herself are in the third person. I've slightly altered this to make it easier to understand, but when you hear Olive's words from the opening weeks of the war, it becomes obvious how distorted her understanding of this conflict was. She assumed it would be a brief affair, providing soldiers like Edward the chance to win glory. Martin Fagan, the archivist, explains Olive's naive views at this time. So she, she has this kind of very naive idea of war in the beginning. I think a lot of people did. You know, that it will all be over very quick and it will be this glorious war. And, and she kind of says... Um, I am so proud you are out there and should be a wee bit disappointed if you are invalided home but so terribly pleased to get you home that I think I should die of pleasedness. What I should really like would be for you to see some fun, get a little wounded, and a lot of glory, sometime within a month or two, and then come back. However, within weeks, the reality of the war was slowly starting to sink in. Initially, it was the scale of the conflict that was taking a toll. It placed unprecedented demands for new recruits on the population. This quickly had an impact in houses like Olive's as large numbers of house servants began to enlist. Olive later reflected on this herself. All the men servants went to the war and we had one parlour maid instead of rows of footmen. However, in the opening months at least, this was all viewed by the aristocracy as a temporary inconvenience. The war, it was believed, would be over by Christmas and then things would return to normal. There was even a sense that everyone should be doing their bit. Olive recalled her war experience in the opening phase of the conflict. I worked with the wives and children of the soldiers because none of them were very good at filling forms. I worked so they would get their proper allowances and things of that sort. However, as the weeks wore on and newspapers began to report huge losses, doubt began to creep into Olive's thoughts. The realisation that her husband Edward might actually be killed started to sink in. We can see this in her war diary. I can't bear to think of him going to the front. I will be imagining he's killed. I haven't heard, but it's too horrid to think even of what it will be like when you get to the front. (sighs) Somehow I feel he will come through all right. But that may only be because I simply can't bear or believe the other. She comforted herself with the age-old ideas that wars brought glory, the ones that she had been raised with. Anyway, we won't talk of it as perhaps the war will be over before he gets up at all. I rather hope for his sake he sees some fun in spite of how ghastly it will be for us not knowing what's happening. Probably never getting any letters. However, her fears were rooted in reality, and this was compounded by the fact that she was pregnant. As we heard at the end of last week's episode, Olive had fallen pregnant within a few weeks of getting married in July 1914. However, in her war diary, she just referred to the pregnancy obliquely as it, a euphemism that perhaps reflected fears that she might miscarry, but also there was no question what should have been a happy time was overshadowed by the war, which was becoming all-consuming. It doesn't exactly encourage one to get up and begin another empty day, in an empty week, in an empty month. It is the beastly uncertainty of not knowing when you will be back. It may be years. It has taken more than half the joy out of it, not having you to share it with. Nothing seems to matter. Not even it sometimes. Except you. You. You.
In November, Olive's worst fears were realised. In 1981, in her last interview, she recalled that fateful November day in 1914. I was living at Rockingham then and my mother-in-law met me at the doorstep from walking out somewhere to say there was a telegram she was missing. Her husband Edward's regiment, the Irish Guards, had been sent to the front and fought in the First Battle of Ypres, one of the most horrific battles in the opening year of the war. On November the 6th, while fighting near Zalbeck in Flanders, Edward went missing when his trench was shelled. This news left Olive reeling. She hoped for the best, but feared the worst. He had disappeared in the middle of a battle. He could be dead, but it was just possible he was alive in a prisoner of war camp in Germany, or perhaps even lying injured in a field hospital somewhere. Six weeks passed and Christmas 1914 approached. A Christmas when the war was supposed to end, but Olive still had no news. She was in a better position than the thousands of working class families who endured a similar fate, but Olive was able to use contacts in the Vatican and even the German aristocracy to try and locate her missing husband. However, as the new year of 1915 was ushered in, there was still no news as to what had happened. Edward had simply vanished. While Olive was devastated by this news, the most likely outcome, that her husband was dead, threw her entire life into chaos. She was expecting Edward's child, but if he was dead, this would have huge consequences for mother and baby. This was not the prospect of being a widow with a young child. Realistically, Olive didn't have to worry about financial concerns that most war widows faced. She would never go hungry or face the degradation of the workhouse. She did face, however, uniquely aristocratic problems. Depending on the sex of the baby, her life would be changed dramatically the moment she gave birth. With families like hers and her in-laws, that's her husband's family, the Stafford King Harmons, nothing was ever left to chance when it came to inheritance. Family wills were extremely complex documents that accounted for every eventuality. Now in terms of the Stafford King Harmon family, that's her in-laws, an ancestor in past generations had stipulated that the Rockingham estate and the family fortune was entailed to male descendants only. Women could not inherit. Now the implications of this for Olive were huge. If she gave birth to a girl, this would mean the house she lived in, along with the estate and the family fortune, would pass to her brother-in-law, Cecil, after her father-in-law, Thomas Stafford, died. She would have no place in this house. However, if she had a son, he would be the heir and Olive would remain in Rockingham, which in time her son would inherit. By April... As her due date approached, there was no definitive news of what had happened to her husband Edward. But either way, it was becoming clear the chances of him being alive were extremely low. Olive went into labour knowing that the sex of her baby would alter the course of her life. The archivist in Strokestown Park House, Martin Fagan, explains this. Imagine that, you know, she's given birth. Is it a boy or a girl? And that decision, and that decision changes everything. So it's a girl, so therefore... She comes back to Strokestown. Um, the estate, then the Rockingham estate, goes to Edward's brother, um, Cecil. Now, as Martin has revealed there, the child was a girl. Named Letice, although she was called Lettuce, the child would not inherit the estate of her deceased father. Indeed, in the following months, Olive became increasingly desperate to find out what had happened to her husband, perhaps still clinging to some hope he might be alive somewhere. Martin Fagan explains how in the summer of 1915 they even enlisted the services of a clairvoyant. We've got a, a collection of letters from, we think, someone in, in, in Rockingham, possibly his nanny. I don't think it's his mother, we think it's his nanny. This is the following year, uh, 1915 in July. I've seen um, Von Borg again, I um, was with him for nearly an hour and that's the clairvoyant. He held my hand for ages and I held the crystal for, crystal for ages. And he simply could not get beyond, get beyond what he'd always said, that he, in other words Edward, was left for dead and carried to the back of German lines and has never been in an ordinary prison. He remembered curiously about Edward while he held my hand and about him telling him that he would have a desperately narrow shave in the autumn. Now this decision to visit Van Borg, the clairvoyant, was not as strange as it initially seems. The Swiss native Otto van Borg had come to prominence in 1901 when a distressed widow claimed he had communicated with her late murdered husband and helped locate his missing body. 
In 1909, he was hired by treasure hunters to join an expedition searching for the Ark of Covenant. Now, unsurprisingly, he came up short on that occasion. But after the outbreak of war in 1914, interest in clairvoyance and the supernatural increased. Thousands of families sought to understand what had happened to their loved ones who went missing or connect with those killed. Unsurprisingly, Van Borg was not able to help Olive, but she was clearly growing increasingly desperate. Finally, she gained a degree of clarity in the summer of 1915. Although no body had been found, the army stated Edward was in fact dead and had been killed on November 6th, 1914. A small notice was published in the London newspapers. Captain Edward Stafford King Harmon, Irish Guards, now reported killed, was born in 1891 and was educated at Stone House, Broadstairs, Eton and Sandhurst. He joined the Irish Guards in 1911 and has been missing since November 6th. He was the eldest son of Sir Thomas and Lady Stafford, and leaves a widow and a daughter, born in April last. Edward's body was never found. Indeed, Olive would only find out what happened to him in the late 1970s. He had been blown to pieces in a direct strike from a shell. He had not been found because there was no body to find. Back in 1915, Olive's life was completely upended by this. In the space of less than a year, she had been married, given birth to a child and now widowed. And on top of that, she had to leave Rockingham, the house where she had moved to with her husband and returned to her home, Strokestown Park House, bringing her daughter, Latisse, with her. In the following months and years, Olive was consumed by grief. The archivist at Strokestown Park House, Martin Fagan, has been able to find evidence of her mental anguish in her writing. She's kind of very broken. You, know, yeah. you can see it and you can even see it in the way the handwriting kind of changes wow. in the diary itself. It gets very, very wild. You know, the handwriting gets big and wild and it's, and it's rep- a lot of repetition. Indeed, from later interviews and letters, it seems that she never quite overcame the loss of her husband, Edward, even though she would live for another 61 years. However, her experience of the war, while traumatic, was by no means uncommon. The enormous death rate was contributing to a growing crisis in Britain and Ireland in the years following 1914. For Olive and her class, the huge number of heirs to major estates being killed created legal nightmares. In 1981, in that last interview, Olive was asked about the war and she said, It practically annihilated the type of young men who came out of this type of house. However, a far more important issue, and one that had not quite crystallised by 1915, was the burden that the war was taking on the wider population. Demands for change, forged in the horrors of the Western Front, gained traction as the war dragged on, seemingly endlessly. It wasn't just soldiers, though, who wanted change. The women, who were keeping the economy going at home, wanted more than what the pre-war world had offered them. This was deeply alarming for the aristocracy. Indeed, change of any kind is always alarming for aristocrats. When you're at the top, the only way is down. And in the later years of the war, they were about to fall very far, very fast. The Russian Revolution in February 1917, which deposed the Roman of dynasty and most of the Russian aristocracy, was the first clear sign that no matter what happened, the old world was precisely that, old Something new was going to take its place during or after the war. In Ireland, the first signs that the Packen and Mahans and other similar families faced the prospect of major change took place during the Republican uprising in Dublin at Easter 1916. While the rebels were defeated in a week of bitter fighting in the capital, the reaction in the following months revealed a growing hostility towards the British administration in Ireland and the war itself. As demands for independence gained traction through 1917, the Packen and Mahans were increasingly alienated from wider Irish society. In her final interview in 1981, Olive spelled out the family's view on Irish independence. No, we would have been on the side of maintaining the union with Britain. Indeed, if you visit Strokestown Park House today, these views are still writ large throughout the building. When I was in the library, Oisin first pointed to a large picture of William of Orange, the 17th century king who was a talisman for unionists. That's just above the mantelpiece 
If you look directly opposite it on the table here, we have a pretty big plaster bust of Arthur Wellesley, the Duke of Wellington. So you've got the Duke of Wellington, you've got King William of Orange. It couldn't be clearer sort of where their politics lie. The path they were choosing, or rather one that had been chosen over successive generations, was taking the family into very precarious territory in the early 20th century. We saw last week that even before the war, they were losing ground literally and metaphorically. In 1912, they had sold their vast estate, the basis of their power in Roscommon. And now, during the war, wedded to their conservative worldviews, they set them on a collision course with the majority of the population who were increasingly radicalised by the war. It didn't take a genius to figure out that this would not end well. Now, it's important to say that Olive and her parents were not mere bystanders being swept along in wider events during the latter years of the First World War. They were very much part of the British administration and establishment in Ireland. Indeed, Olive regularly socialised with a man who had become one of the most reviled figures in Irish society in the last months of World War I and the following years. That's Field Marshal Lord John French. French was born in England with ancestral connections to Roscommon and had bought Drumdo House not far from Strokestown with plans to retire in Ireland when his military career came to an end. However, in early 1918, he had been appointed Viceroy of Ireland with extensive powers to crush the growing unrest in the country. By this stage, threats to introduce conscription in Ireland was leading to some of the largest protests the island had ever seen. Now, Lord John French advocated pretty extreme measures, including using airplanes on public demonstrations. While the British authorities pulled back from what would have been a reckless course of action, this had already suggested that French was not the man to steer the British administration in Ireland through what was going to be a very unsettled post-war world. Yet, Olive and her family continued to cultivate relations with this man. He was even entertained in Strokestown Park House in August 1918. The connections between Olive and Lord French deepened a few months later when Thomas Stafford, that's the father of Olive's late husband, who she was close to, joined the Viceroy's Advisory Council in December 1918. However, events started to move at a breakneck speed in Ireland in the following months and soon families like the Packen and Mahans would find themselves powerless to influence events. Before we continue with the episode, I just want to remind you that there's bonus content with additional interviews from Strokestown Park House available for show supporters at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. These include interviews where Ushin explains more about the house itself, why there is no ballroom and who Olive's mother, May Burrard, was. Martin explains more about Olive's father Henry and his adult tastes in photography and art and who he shared these with. This is all available at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. That's patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. You'll find links in the show notes below. World War I finally ended in November 1918, but peace didn't return to Ireland. British authority on the island had been immeasurably weakened by the war. It was at its lowest ebb since the 1790s. In a general election in December 1918, Sinn Féin won the vast majority of seats across the island. Now this was a party that Olive feared and loathed. When asked what her view of the party president, Eamon de Valera, was in 1918, she replied, Well, we thought he was the devil's bottom. Her views on de Valera would change, but back in 1918, it was very clear there were difficult days ahead for the Packen and Mahans. The story of the Irish War of Independence, which began a few months after that election, is covered in a 25-part series linked in the show notes below, so I'm not going to go through that in any great detail. But it's fair to say that Olive did not have a stereotypical Irish experience of the War of Independence. Her social and political connections to the Viceroy, Lord John French, who became the most hated man in Ireland in 1919, certainly left little doubt about where her loyalties lay. Indeed, she would later recall how she regularly attended dinners in the Viceregal Lodge, that's French's official residence. But at Christmas in 1919, the reality that politics had major consequences in Ireland was brought sharply into focus 
when Lord French was ambushed by the IRA while returning to Dublin from Roscommon. He escaped by the narrowest of margins, but a few months later, a member of his advisory council, Frank Brooke, was not so lucky. He was killed by the IRA in an ambush. It's worth remembering that Olive's father-in-law was also a member of this same body, the advisory council. However, while violence was escalating dramatically through 1920, Olive was still able to live a relatively normal life. She attended the races at the Curragh in July 1920, although trains connecting the racecourse to Dublin had been seriously delayed when the locomotives were commandeered by the police. During these months, though, the relationship between her family, the Packen and Mahans, and the local people in North Roscommon was becoming increasingly complex. In her final interview in 1981, Olive claimed that when her father took the precaution of having an armed escort, this offended the people of Strokestown because they claimed they would never harm him. Olive would even go as far as describing them as our people. Now this is a somewhat rose-tinted view of what the reality was in the town and how the family were perceived locally. While some people undoubtedly held them in fond regard, others definitely did not. For example, Patrick Malouli, who was born and raised just two kilometres from Strokestown Park House, certainly did not consider himself one of the Packen and Mahans people. He was a captain in the local IRA and would later be the quartermaster of the North Roscommon Brigade. When reflecting on his revolutionary experiences, he mentioned the family and how the memory of the famine evictions, which had seen Olive's great-grandfather assassinated, still lingered in the area. The Mahan family of Strokestown Domain were the landlords of that district then. Years previously, especially during the famine years, they oppressed their tenants so cruelly that one of the family, a major man, was shot dead about four miles from Strokestown. While Olive's father, Henry Packenham Mahan, was never targeted by the IRA, the wider situation was deteriorating rapidly and the future looked more and more uncertain as the year of 1920 dragged on. Those who desired a close union with Britain, like Olive, were increasingly divided about how they should proceed. In late 1920, their heartland in eastern Ulster was partitioned from the rest of Ireland. This was done to secure the interests of unionists in that region, but it isolated families like the Packen and Mahans in Roscommon even further as they now had lost their key allies. Increasingly fearful of where the war was going to take the rest of Ireland, including Roscommon, Families like Olive's began to call for a de-escalation of the conflict. Indeed, Olive's former father-in-law, Thomas Stafford, resigned from the advisory council because of the intransigence of the British government and their refusal to adopt a more conciliatory approach. However, the reality was, by early 1921, Southern Unionists, like the Packen and Mahans, had very little say over what was happening. They had once been masters of the island, but as the War of Independence approached its most lethal phase in that year of 1921, many of these families had already fled Ireland and were now living in their houses in England, watching events unfold as things just went from bad to worse from their perspective. After the British Army adopted a policy of retributions, where they burned the houses of IRA volunteers and in some cases towns and even the city centre of Cork City, The IRA responded by burning the houses of the aristocracy, the symbols of British power on the island. This obviously made Strokestown Park House a possible target. However, somewhat ironically, it was saved because the family had cultivated even deeper relations with the authorities in early 1921, when soldiers from the 9th Lancers and the East Yorkshire regiments had occupied the house and used it as a barracks. Oshino Driscoll, the historian and guide in Strokestown, explains... People often ask, uh, you know, why wasn't this house burned? Why wasn't this house attacked, you know, when so many were? And the short answer is that, is that the, the soldiers are here, basically. So, you know, if you were the IRA and you've got a choice, are we going to attack that house? Are we going to attack the house that's full of soldiers? You're not an idiot. You're going to attack the house that isn't full of soldiers. So the house actually basically survived unscathed pretty much because of that reason. The occupation by the British Army resulted in parts of Strokestown Park House being transformed into a military barracks of a kind. The soldiers built a gym over the stables where some of their equipment remains to this day. Martin Fagan, the archivist, is currently preparing an exhibition on the Revolutionary Era and he showed me a huge mural made by the East Yorkshire Regiment in this room which has survived over the last century. Um, So when they were here, they painted this mural on the wall. Um, And this is is an original um, 
it's the regimental crest. So you have the East Yorkshire Regiment and then the various campaigns that they were involved in, um, Afghanistan, 1879 to 80, and then the Great War, 19, 1914. The occupation of the house brought the War of Independence right into the Pakenham Mahan family home, though. Three soldiers garrisoned there were among the six members of the Crown Forces killed in the Scrimog ambush, not far from the house. Then, over a week later, on April the 4th, the nearby Culla police barracks was burned by the IRA. That was actually a building owned by the Pakenham Mahans as well. Indeed, fears the house itself might be targeted led to the installation of defences, some of which survive at Strokestown right up to the present day. Oshino Driscoll brought me to the rear of the house to show me one. They were worried that this was an exposed position because anyone down in the fields behind the house, there's these rolling fields that go off way into the distance. There's any amount of places that someone who was a good shot could hide and take pot shots at the soldiers and officers as they're going in and out. So they, the soldiers themselves built a walkway essentially. So it's a, a metal lined curved walkway that runs from the stables over into the main house. And it has this uh, pretty thick tin covering that is supposed to theoretically at least be bulletproof. Um, so yeah, so this is, uh, yeah, this is, this is a relic of the, of the, the wartime experience of this house. While Olive and her family were in their house in Pont Street in London and relatively safe, but they must have been wondering when, if ever, it would be safe to return to Ireland. Indeed, even when a truce was agreed, their political irrelevancy was increasingly laid bare. Another landlord who supported Ireland's union with Britain, Lord Middleton, had played a key role in establishing an initial truce in the hopes that the interests of families like his own and the Pakenham Mahans would be protected in any treaty between the Republican movement and the British government. However, Lord Middleton was immediately sidelined when a Republican delegation, led by Eamon de Valera, went to London to negotiate with the British Prime Minister, David Lloyd George. It was clear that no one cared much for the Irish aristocracy. In the minds of many, and not just people in Ireland, they were seen as the architects of their own downfall, and their interests certainly would not dictate the nature of any treaty on the future of Ireland. Olive, however, who had been in London through the later phase of the war, immediately returned to Strokestown when the truce was agreed, but she found a very different house from the one she had been raised in. There were nearly 200 soldiers garrisoned in the grounds, while staff officers were now living in the house. And I would presume the officers were in the house and then the, the men were stationed elsewhere in the outbuildings. We have some receipts from, um, from the period like to say that the army they, you know, they did a, a recce on the house and to see what rooms and what they, could, what, what they needed. And there's also some bills for repairs to fences and gates and stuff that the army had, had damaged while they were here. The final months of 1921 were changing the lives of most Irish people as it became clear there was a high possibility the British Army were going to withdraw from Ireland. And Olive was no different. However, the change that she experienced was pretty unpredictable. No one, including herself, could have foreseen what would happen to her when she returned to Ireland. It was only within days of arriving back in Strokestown Park House that Olive began what was a deeply controversial, even scandalous relationship in the eyes of some, with one of the soldiers garrisoned in the house, Captain Stuart Hales. Indeed, the two would be engaged to be married in less than a fortnight, Something that would cause scandal, not because of the brevity of the relationship, but because Stuart was considered by Olive's family to be unsuitable. He was three years her younger, but more importantly for Olive's parents, he was not of the same class. While he was an army man, he was not an aristocrat. His father was also a former army officer, but by 1921 he was a prison governor. While they may have considered this beneath their daughter, the Pakenham Mahans clearly hadn't realised yet that their power and prestige was in freefall. However, in terms of Olive and Stuart, they seem to have genuinely loved each other. The best insights into their whirlwind romance comes from a series of letters they exchanged in later 1921. Olive returned to England while Stuart remained in Strokestown as the peace negotiations between the Irish Republican movement and the British government continued in London. The couple, however, exchanged letters every day and Olive's letters to Stuart survive in the Strokestown Park archive, leaving us with a picture of a surprisingly passionate affair. Olive certainly didn't hold back in her letters to Stuart. 
How would you like to make love to me across a dirty, marble-topped table? I'd give anything at the moment to see you, dear, across anything. There's no question the two were engaged in a sexual relationship while Olive had been in Strokestown. When she got back to London, she was seeing a doctor about contraception. While I was there, I asked Dr Gavin about Marie's little hat. He showed me one and said it was all very well if you could get a doctor to fit it frequently, but you wanted to be an acrobat to do it yourself. The mention of Mary's little hat is a reference to the birth control campaigner Mary Stopes. However, alongside this passionate relationship, the memory of Olive's first husband was always present. Even at the end of her life, when she spoke about Edward, it was clear he still meant a great deal to her, despite the fact 65 years had passed since his death. However, in 1921, rather than his memory being an obstacle in her new relationship, it appears she was able to discuss it openly with Stuart. She wrote to him in late 1921. I'm sure Edward is glad, very glad, that I am so happy again and that I'm in love with the right, straight-up sort of man. Seven years last Sunday. It seems so odd when I went to church early to be able to love two people so very much. One because I can't live without him and one as a wonderful memory. Indeed, it appears Olive and Stuart were able to use the trauma they had both endured during the war as a foundation for their relationship. Martin Fagan, the archivist in Strokestown, explains. I'd like to think that they had somehow bonded over that, their experiences. You know, yeah. I, think, I think most people of that generation would have had, would have had a lot of um, shared stories. While the couple forged this relationship, the wider world was changing rapidly. They would marry in London on December the 19th, 1921. However, this low-key ceremony was overshadowed by the momentous events that had taken place in the city 13 days earlier. A treaty had been agreed between Irish Republican representatives and the British government that would see 26 of Ireland's 32 counties, including Olive's native Roscommon, leave the United Kingdom. This left Olive in a precarious position, to say the least. While her family had opposed Irish independence at every turn, and had a checkered relationship with the local community. Her husband, Stuart, would be even more problematic if he lived in Ireland. He had come to the island to fight against independence. Indeed, the issue of where the couple would live had already been a point of contention between the two. Stuart had assumed they would move back to England. He presumably had little desire to live in Ireland. However, in her letters, Olive made it clear she wouldn't marry him if she had to leave Ireland. Her complex identity emerges in these letters. Darling, of course I would marry you, but not under the conditions you lay down. You say I should have to keep you at home and come back here. You simply must realise that home to me is and always will be Ireland. If you want to marry me, you must realise that you are marrying a woman of another nationality to yourself. Ireland is my home, not England. She gave voice to staunchly unionist views, which is an identity that doesn't really exist in Ireland anymore. Most unionists in Ireland identify as British today. This does not mean in any way that I am not loyal to the bone, because I am. Father had never given a damn for what people said. He went over regularly, regardless of everything, and I have always done the same, and brought Latisse up to do so too. Irish women aren't frightened of their own country. Stuart acquiesced and the two moved back to Ireland, but there was a degree of apprehension. Life wasn't going to be easy. Indeed, within six months, a civil war would have broken out, and the anti-treaty side were extremely hostile to families like the Packen and Mahans. It's remarkable, by 1922, Olive was only 28. And in part three, we're going to follow her story as the world she had grown up in completely disintegrates. Indeed, most of the people she had known had already left Ireland. When asked about how other Irish aristocratic families reacted to Irish independence and the conflict itself, she said, They, they poured out of Ireland. The houses were left empty and then burned. Olive would remain, however, and in part three, we're going to follow her story as she lives in Ireland through the tumultuous 1920s, 
then the Second World War, right up to the 1980s. This is in some ways the most interesting aspect of her life, in my opinion, because at times she tries to pretend that nothing has changed, but her house and indeed lots of aspects of her life were crumbling around her as she became the relic of a bygone age in a very different Ireland. Now don't forget to check out the bonus episodes that accompany the series at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. That's patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. Until next time, Sloan. Sloan.